Good evening, everyone. I'm slightly embarrassed about being called distinguished, particularly in front of the former mayor of Bogota and the former uh, chairman of the Royal Institute of British Architects. But thank you, Tony, for the uh, invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you all also for coming out on a Monday evening um, to this important debate and discussion. As Tony mentioned, this is an interesting and important week for Shell. Last week in Washington, uh, we launched our latest global scenarios. And in Shell, we've been using scenario planning as a, uh, a reinforcement tool for the strategic planning process uh, since the early 1970s. It's a process which allows us, in a sense, to future-proof the decisions we make about the business to today uh, against the, what the world may look like in 40 years' time. And the approach brings a more interactive and human uh, a dimension to those strategy discussions by asking a series of what-if questions uh, about the impact of known events, but also about uncertainties uh, as they play out over the future. And so being here this evening uh, to talk about cities is particularly opportune, uh, both because it gives us um, what we hope will be a valuable opportunity uh, to engage um, a new audience of people in the New Lens scenario content. I've seen many people carrying the books around. There are copies outside for those who don't have them. Uh, it's also available from the iTunes store and for download from the Shell website. But also to say a little bit about the work that we've been doing on cities over the past uh, couple of years uh, and their impact on human development. Now, Tony's already talked about uh, the extent of urban development. The statistics are truly startling. In a world population of 9 billion people, by the middle of this century, almost every single additional person on the planet uh, between now and 2050 will be accounted for in a city. And that's a growth rate, which is an absolutely staggering 1.3 million people a week, and when factored up, amounts to about eight new Londons every year for the next 40 years. So I think it would be no understatement to say that urbanization represents possibly the biggest single social and demographic disruption of the early 21st century. And as hundreds of millions of people move out of poverty for the first time, the world's uh, precious resources will become increasingly stressed. And cities will be the place where those stresses aggregate. About 80% of all energy consumed in the world will be done so in cities and roughly the same proportion of emissions generated. And of course, associated problems with the quality of air and water, shortages of available land for food production, and of course, things like congestion from vehicles are all well-known uh, uh, subjects. Our new lens scenarios are, are called new lens because we've used a number of emergent, uh, um, I guess I'd call them contradictions, uh, which we refer to as lenses, as things which under, underpinning uh, civil society uh, and global decision making. And I just want to spend a few minutes just talking about some of those. First of all, our paradox lenses, which are uh, embodying current tensions and are highlighting key features in the emerging landscape. And the first of those is a prosperity paradox, which illustrates both how economic development raises living standards, but can also bring stresses, environmental, financial, social, and political, which have the capacity to undermine the benefits of wealth creation. If we bring that back to cities, cities with abundant resources grow historically in quite an organic way and have a tendency to sprawl unless there are specific constraints, and we think of places like Singapore or Hong Kong, which inhibit the growth uh, uh, of the city footprint. And that sprawl has the tendency to lock in deep energy and resource inefficiency into the infrastructure, which is incredibly costly and difficult to re-engineer. Poorer crowded cities will also run the same risk, clearly for different reasons, if, as many do, they also follow an organic development pathway. Turning then to the second paradox in connectivity. Connectivity facilitates individual expression and empowerment, but also encourages herd behavior. It amplifies swings uh, in confidence and demand. And the burgeoning availability of information has the capacity both to bring insight and transparency. But with an overload of data, you're equally likely to generate confusion and doubts about authenticity and trust. Now, again, in the context of cities, government have to offer incentives and sanctions for smart growth, with business playing a much greater role in creating smarter, integrated solutions in areas like energy, uh, like housing information, uh, mobility, water, and waste. And so civil society, as well, has to be part, uh, a part of that trade-off, but in a demand sense. 
uh, between this state of conspicuous consumption of goods and the inevitable impact that that consumption has on resources. So to prosper, all groups must work together in a connected way. And finally, the leadership paradox. Addressing the global stresses that we see today requires coordination amongst an increasing number of constituencies of decision makers. But the more diverse the groups that are involved, the more that vested interests tend to block progress. There's an often cited African proverb, one you're probably aware of, which suggests that to go fast, you need to go alone, but to go far, you should go together. Grappling with the growing stresses that we see requires that we both go fast and far, which implies a paradoxical need to go alone and together. So for city leaders uh, that consider problems too hard to solve or solutions too popular to execute, stresses in cities will often be ignored until a state where livability in those cities uh, is compromised. And the gulf between uh, electoral and infrastructure time horizons is one which is enormously hard to bridge. And yet bridging it is absolutely necessary for healthy urban development. Moving to our pathway lenses, these describe different ways in which individuals and groups behave under stresses or when facing uh, situations of crisis. Some will exhibit resilience that creates positive economic and social capital. It enables them to adapt and reform. And a good example of this in the context of the scenario work is the response of the BRIC economies in the first wave of economic volatility from the global banking crisis in 2008. And we call that trend, uh, that process, room to maneuver. Others, meanwhile, struggle in a state of denial or paralysis as crisis escalates, and they start to use responses uh, which, rather than solving uh, the situation, um, actually aggravate the long-term prognosis and typically end in a state of dramatic write-off or reset. And this is a state that we've called trap transition. Again, contemporary examples of this include the Eurozone nations and their failure to make significant process towards stabilizing uh, the indebted economies of, of Greece and other European nations, or from a completely different perspective, um, but nonetheless relevant to the trap transition archetype, the response of the Assad regime to popular uprising in Syria. And again, by applying the behavioral archetypes I've just described uh, to cities, it's possible to see how they too can be routinely impacted by the pace and efficiency with which decisions are taken in order to address the stresses. In Room to Maneuver, we see visionary leadership creating innovative coalitions of public and private sectors which shape growth and progress in cities. Decision makers identify stresses and they intervene early to invoke swift solutions or form collaborations. And structural solutions follow quickly in areas like compact urban development, mass transit systems, and integrated technologies like combined heat and power or indeed district heating schemes. And we tend to think about smart cities in terms of technological solutions. But of course, smartness is also a factor in how policy thinking uh, is translated into decision-making behavior. In trap transition, meanwhile, market forces dictate growth with the outcome often being infrastructure sprawl and inefficiency uh, locked in very, very early. Authorities, assuming that problems are too hard to tackle, uh, don't uh, create the conditions for solutions, uh, believing that they will be too unpopular to implement. Stresses become ignored until livability is threatened, and the results of that process are often too plain to see, with cities starting to fail, typified by crime and disorder, by urban decay, people moving out of the cities, and problems associated with corruption and, and, and of course, economic decline. I'd like to share briefly with you before concluding some of the work that we've been doing on urban China. By the end of 2010, the Chinese urban population was existed, uh, estimated, excuse me, at 660 million people. By 2030, an additional 300 million people are expected to have joined the urban ranks of China by, mi by migration or birth. Now, according to McKinsey, as many as a quarter of total global growth in liquid fuel demand in the next 20 years is expected just to come from China's cities. Shell's been working in China for some time, and we've recently considered urbanization there as part of uh, a project which has looked more broadly at the future energy needs of the country. And one of the key insights, and I think one of the most exciting things that that study was able to find, is that by focusing on density alone, 
uh, uh, in small to medium-sized cities, and we're talking about creating um, density roughly equal to the average density of London or, or the density of Paris. It could be possible to contain all urban growth in China to 2030 within the existing urban footprint. We looked at something like 480 cities of, of 100,000 to half a million people uh, in looking at this. And that move alone would save an estimated 75,000 square kilometers of arable land in a country which is crying out uh, for arable land. And that's an area almost the size of Scotland. And in doing so, it would create the conditions uh, by which energy could be reduced and emissions impacted. Worldwide, compact design and development and more mass transit could achieve an average saving of 2,000 kilometer vehicle, uh, uh, vehicle kilometers per capita. And yet today, the picture on urban mobility is patchy. Here in Europe, we average about 10% uh, of journeys taken by public transport. Hong Kong is by far and away the most outstanding uh, uh, result, with about 90%. And even in Singapore, which uh, people point to in terms of their integrated transport uh, infrastructure, about 50% of all commuted trips are taken uh, by metro and bus. In Atlanta, it's 1%. And that reflects an urban footprint which was developed during the last century, we believe, around assumptions of how much fuel would cost and how much fuel would be available. To achieve a sustainable urban future, fresh forms of collaboration are required. And they need to cut across the familiar national, public, private, and industry sector boundaries. There are currently no strong models for such collaborations, and they are immensely difficult to get off the ground. And the reason for that is because different parties involved in trying to achieve them have their, their, their um, focus uh, principally on the foreground issues and the responsibilities um, that they are concerned with um, right in front of them. So a question perhaps for further discussion this evening will be, how do we harness the power of the private sector um, from, from our perspective to be a positive agent for change in cities. I think from those of us here representing companies today, there is no shortage of experience in handling the sort of scale infrastructure and information systems projects that are needed, but we don't have the current business models uh, which enable us uh, to work together in this way around the development in cities, even if we can, and I'm sure we can, see the enormous financial upside associated with working on the future of urban development. So with increased wealth comes expectation. And the lesson from the developed world is that an inexorable growth in demand for goods and services increases reliance on uh, energy and adds to a resource stress problem. Urban livability is partially served through increasing environmental standards and their requirements for more technically advanced solutions come at an enormous cost premium. And the perception gap today between what people expect to pay for resources and what they actually cost is extremely wide. I hope that this brief overview of some of our thinking demonstrates the value in making cities a focus. If the issues which are associated with city development are ignored, and that can keep, uh, um, we keep in a situation where the can is, is kicked down the road, then I'm afraid that all too soon, the problems that are associated uh, um, with urban development um, will see flexibility in the system lost as bad decisions, or frankly no decisions, get taken, and rigidity becomes locked into um, bad infrastructure. If we can succeed in getting government, society, and business working to be to better together, however, then cities could provide the hope for a sustainable planet uh, of nine billion people. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, I hope, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and um, for allowing Shell's continued involvement in this process and I look forward to the conversation. I'm just going to flick through the sides I forgot to flick through during the uh, presentation. But thank you very much. Before you uh, get away too lightly, let me, um, let me just ask a question. I mean, you, you spoke towards the end about the power of the private sector, and clearly uh, Shell's a very large private company, but there'll, there'll be others here represented. Now, in the world that we're discussing, city government, city governance, is always at some level 
in this complicated, growth-driven, uh, very sort of challenging urban environment, government's going to have to spend a lot of time stopping people doing things they want. Obviously, it has to facilitate them, but it also has to stop them sprawling, travelling in vehicles that are bad for the environment, and, and, and. Now, do you not feel that for the private sector to get involved in the sordid and awkward business of helping politicians who are elected to be unpopular risks the private sector's um, reputation? Well, I, th I think there'd be people in the audience that would, um, um, would, would um, view the private sector's involvement in all manner of activities in, in uh, engagement with government at a, at, a, at a national or local level to be... Uh, 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 um, well, may have a mixed impression about it. I mean, I, for me... But I'm I, saying that the business is, you know, <laughs> on balance, worried about its own reputation. Politicians are almost always, you know, apart from the week they're elected, unpopular. So I'm saying is a sort of risk to the private sector in trying to help in these complex... Because it's all rationing. Well, in the I, end, I, I, think, I think there is, of course, a risk inherent in it, as there is in a lot of business activities. But I would go back to some um, pretty fundamental research that was done on the scale of the opportunity associated with involvement in, in city development. In fact, I think the, the gentleman and, and his colleagues who are involved in that are here in the audience this evening. And, and based on the assumption that two-thirds of urban infrastructure required by the middle of this century is yet to be built, the mind-boggling figure of $300 trillion associated with urban development uh, in the coming period will, will need to be found. So when I talk about the absence of business models which make it possible for Shell working with IBM uh, to find a way of unlocking uh, access to some kind of that value, of course there's a commercial self-interest associated mm. in that. But, but on the point of, of, of reputation or tarnishing thereof, I, I, I suspect that's not actually the, the, the kind of the key issue. And... Well, that's sort of encouraging, really. I mean, as far as city governments are concerned, I mean, do you find them or do you think they are likely to be amenable to either ideas you can bring them from the private sector and other private companies can bring them from the private sector? Right. I think the notion that, that local government is already switched on to working with the private sector in, in uh, um, many spheres is, is, is a misnomer. I think there is an opportunity um, to work with visionary government that understands the need for long-term planning um, as businesses like ours have to if we want to be a business in 30 years' time uh, to recognise the, the, the scale of the bigger opportunity. Mm. It will not be easy, and in certainly in, in cases, I think Mayor Penalosa is the person to, to talk about that, uh, will not necessarily be popular. But my fear is if we don't take these decisions soon in the next five to ten years, then the issue of lock-in will, will really cripple so many cities at the time when this growth will really determine whether or not cities will be part of the solution or an ongoing part of a problem that we can all recognise. Okay. Well, Adam, for now, uh, thank you very much.